Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the International Society of Automation and BMEX titled Calibration Uncertainty and Why Technicians Need to Understand It. I'm Katie Turner, Marketing Manager here at BMEX in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'll be one of your hosts today. I'm also joined by BMEX Client Services Manager, Ms. Sarah Kinnon, and um, ISA Corporate Partners Coordinator, Michaela Cooper. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how the webinar will run today. If you haven't noticed already, we are using video so you can see our presenters' faces and get a little bit more interaction than you normally would. Um, there will be two question and answer sessions. One will come about halfway through and the second will be at the very end. We do encourage you to participate in today's live polls and those will be brought up on your screen and the presenters will walk you through how to interact with those as well. And we'd really like to hear from you guys about what you'd like to see next, so we would appreciate any feedback you could give us on the survey that will appear following the webinar in your browser. And with that, I will hand it over to Ms. Sarah Kinnon to introduce our speakers for today. All right, thank you, Katie. If you don't mind sharing the screen, and before we give the, the speakers a chance to teach us all about uncertainty, I think we should learn a little bit about them. First, we have Ned Espy. He's promoted calibration management with BMEX for over 20 years now. During that time, he's developed calibration best practices with a focus on temperature, pressure, and multivariable instruments. He's a consistent editorial contributor to leading industry magazines and has received significant recognition within the automation industry. Today, today, Ned teaches calibration best practices to our end users and to the BMEX team in North America. Next up, the Viceroy of Ca Calibration, better known and commonly known to us as Roy Tomolino. He's been teaching calibration management for over 15 years. Throughout his career, he has taught on over four different continents to over 40 different, um, on over 40 different countries, excuse me. His previous roles include technical marketing engineer and worldwide trainer for Hewlett Packard and application engineer with Honeywell. Today, Roy evangelizes to, he evangelizes best practices for calibration to just about anyone who will listen. And there is much more to say about these two gentlemen, but that's all I'll say today. So, Katie, what else do you have for us? Katie, I'm afraid you're on mute. Thank you, Sarah. Before I hand it over to the presenters today, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about an event that is coming up on August 2nd and 3rd at Harvard University. It's the Best Practices Interactive Calibration Workshop. Um, we do only have about four seats remaining for this event, so if you're interested, definitely check it out. The um, link there is in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and I'm going to change slides, but the link will be, appear in the same spot there again at the bottom. And what this is, it's, it's, it's an interactive workshop that also includes um, a tour of Harvard's Blackstone Steam Plant, and you get 11 professional development hours for attending. And we will send you a link um, to this following the webinar, so if you don't have time to jot that down, do not worry. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Ned Espy to begin today's presentation. All right, Katie and Sarah, thank you for the nice introduction. Welcome, everybody, to our presentation on uncertainty and why it's important for technicians. Uh, just very briefly, want to go through our agenda. We have some introductory slides to go through, and our key word today is uncertainty the U word, and uh, so we want to help you understand some of the basics, and then Roy is going to demonstrate uh, how different re, uh, calibration standards 
can be used to make measurements and make sure there are quality measurements. After that, we'll have a brief Q&A session. Then we're going to take a deeper dive and try to uh, do some analysis of error using some statistical methods and, uh, and then try to apply that to the real world. And then Roy will come back with another demonstration with a more in-depth look at the uncertainty information with another Q&A session. So with that, let's get started. So I guess one thing we were referred to as SMEs and uh, our legal team here strongly urged us to put up this disclaimer. Um, you know, we have simplified what we're showing today and uh, I'm sure there's some metrology professionals out there so we don't, uh, we don't claim to cover all the details uh, and maybe to the depth that some others would. But our intent is to cover the basics and uh, uh, help people get a better understanding. Yeah, so that's true. And Ned's actually just being modest. He's actually smart enough to be a subject matter expert. This disclaimer is for me. So, but thank you for being so nice about that, Ned. Uh, thank you, Roy. Yeah. So, uh, so one of the goals for our uh, technician folks is we just want to like demystify this information, try to uh, provide some insight, and at the same time. Uh, present some best practices and provide insight to management on uh, how to make good quality measurements in your plant. So, oops, sorry about that. So, just uh, we're going to kind of build one block at a time here. So, just to get on first base here, you know, what is calibration and why should you calibrate? It's an activity where you're comparing an, uh, an instrument under test against a known reference value. And when we talk about a known reference value, we're typically saying a calibrator or some type of standard. And that standard should be traceable back to really international uh, agreements. And uh, it should be documented. And uh, you know, so if we want to talk about, you know, why do we calibrate, uh, let's take a little bit deeper look into why, what is a measurement. And at BMEX, we like to say that everything is based on measurements. I mean, we're dealing with process control and we're looking at feedback. You know, you're, you're, you're controlling something, so you, you're making measurements and then based on those measurements, you're making decisions to speed things up, heat things up, cool things off, slow things down, and so on. Uh, obviously, you want to do all this in an optimal way. And uh, to do things optimal, you need to have good quality measurements. And um, so when we're talking about automation, so if we look at our plant on the right there, you know, we, uh, we're, we're trying to have the most optimum process so that we can make a good quality product. And at, at the end of the day, your process control cannot be any better than the quality of the measurements you make. So if you're making some sloppy or inaccurate measurements, you're going to end up with uh, less quality product or more expensive, inefficient processes that uh, reduce your profits. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Um, when we talk about the little chart I had, um, obviously the, the first component is a sensor or a transducer. So that's down at the very beginning of the measurement. And uh, typically sensors are then connected to transmitters or they're built into transmitters so that we can send the measurement into our control system. And then finally, something has to receive that signal, whether it's a PLC or the DCS. Uh, so that's sort of the process flow of making a measurement. And you can see it can be complex with multiple devices in a loop. And it's important that you understand, well, how accurate is the sensor? 
and how does that impact the accuracy of the transmitter and then how does that impact the interpretation by the control system so that you get good control elements coming back out of the system. So, so we've looked at the measurement side and we've talked about how we break it down and if we go back to the earlier statements I made about being optimized on what you're doing, we need to be aware that there are always things that can trip us up. So, you know, everybody focuses on accuracy. We're going to talk about that today. But in addition to the base accuracy of an instrument or a calibrator, there's other factors that maybe aren't as significant but need to be considered. There's, uh, you know, how linear is the device? Does it have hysteresis? Uh, does it have some other phenomenon that you need to analyze? Uh, how much does the instrument drift over time? Does it drift in a, significantly in a six-month window, a one-year window? Uh, when you're looking at readouts or gauges, you know, what's the resolution that you can see? And uh, what is the repeatability of the instrument? If you cycle it a couple times, do you see uh, uh, non-repeatable results and, and how sensitive is the instrument, especially to temperature? Can temperature and then finally, here's uncertainty down at the bottom. So all these things and more can contribute to, uh, to poor quality or, or off quality when it comes to making measurements. All right, so that's sort of my introduction. So now I want everybody to wake up. So all you guys that are, uh, if you're looking at something else, we want some feedback from you. So could you please look at your screen? And one question we'd like to know and kind of understand from our audience is, you know, do you have tolerances that you've defined in your plant for testing? So in other words, do you have a, a good plan and you have a, a, a good organization on, on what kind of tolerances you're expecting to get out of your process? And one note on this is there are no judgments involved here. We just want to know yes or no. And it's, we run into both scenarios. Okay, so that's kind of expected. That's good to know. So our audience uh, has taken a look at error in, the, in their plant, and uh, let me jot that down. So uh, really, a very high percentage uh, have a good idea of, of what they expect out of their process. Okay, so let's move on to, we have another question. Um, so again, we're just wanting to get gauge our audience here. So, you know, our big topic today is uncertainty. So for those that have set tolerances and, and have a good approach to their program, do you account for uncertainty in your program? So um, Roy, I guess, wanted us to put uncertain for the third option. But uh, if you're not sure, that's a good answer here. Did you just throw me under the bus? I did. Okay, that's interesting. So we have a, a maybe a 50-50 split uh, with the unsure there. So uh, so good. So maybe that's why uh, you guys are attending today. Um, you're wanting to learn a little bit more about uncertainty and how it, it may Im impact you. So I'm just made a note of that. Uh, we thank you for that feedback. Really good. All right. So uh, on this slide, oops, we jumped two slides. No, we saw it. There we go. So on this slide, let's talk about accuracy. Everybody focuses on accuracy. When I make a presentation to a client, they want to know how accurate is your calibrator. And, uh, you know, and when we're testing an instrument, how accurate is the transmitter? How accurate is the sensor? So on and so forth. So just as a definition, uh, accuracy represents the closeness of a measured value to a known reference value. So, so one thing that's really important here, when you look at a specification for accuracy, since you're comparing it to a known reference value, that needs to be 
considered? How accurate was the instrument that helped you establish the accuracy statement? It needs to obviously be more accurate than the instrument that you're you're saying has a certain accuracy, obviously. Um, in addition to that reference value when you state accuracy, uh, there's other components that can impact performance and quality of the measurement, and we've already kind of listed these. So drift is a big one. Does it drift a little bit, a quarter percent a year, a half a percent a year? You know, uh, and then uh, if it's in a hostile environment that uh, it can be very hot or very cold, how does that affect the transmitter or instrument's ability to make a measurement? When we talk about accuracy as a number, most often we see percent of full scale, uh, maybe for flow, it could be a percent of reading plus a fixed component, some type of adder. So there, that, I call that a compound statement when it has percent of reading and percent of full scale. Now, depending on what somebody says, you know, on their uh, on their specification, it can it can make a lot of difference. So we tried to to show you graphical representation here. So here's a uh, an instrument, if you say it's 0.025% of full scale, and that's a pretty tight number, uh, we've graphed that in blue, but notice that we're saying that the span is 300 PSI. So there's our span. So if you take the 0.025%, that's going to calculate to 0 0.075, and it's, it, the accuracy would meet that specification over the entire range. But here's a percent of reading and full scale combination. So the 0.1% of reading is this slope. So as you go from 0 to 300, you, you're going to, the, the tolerance has to increase. But it also has this fixed component of full scale. It's very small. So it basically has a, an offset. It doesn't start at 0. It starts at the most base number because the percent of, of zero, any percent of zero is zero, and it begins there and then slopes up. But notice on the graph that I'm putting things in PSI. So when you're doing this type of analysis, uh, I just want to make the point that you really need to get out your calculator and take these kind of crazy numbers and turn them into engineering units that apply to your process or your instrument and the way it's ranged. Uh, but you can see in this case, this is quite a bit more accurate by more than double than uh, what this line represents. So th this, is a good, this is a good statement, but this is like really good. Okay. Uh, the next thing when you talk about making quality measurements is you want to demonstrate traceability. So uh, so we have a chain or a pedigree. How do you get from your process all the way back to international recognized standards? And uh, when you're doing calibration, it uh, it's really traceability is one of the base requirements. And you you need to have documentation that says what standard your equipment is traceable to. So in the United States, our national laboratory is NIST. In England, they are, it's called the NPL. In Germany, it's called the PTB. And BMEX is a Finnish company. They have an organization called MIKES. So those are all national bodies. And then they have accreditation bodies associated with them. So in the United States, again, we have A2LA. Uh, you'll see UCOS in the UK, DKD in Germany, and then finally for Finland, it's FINOS. So I'm showing these logos over here, but no matter who, what country you're using, there is an international agreement. It's called the ILAC, and it's the mutual recognized agreement where all countries that have signed uh, NIST recognizes work done by these other labs and vice versa. So if something comes in from Finland, it's accredited by FINOS, certified by MIKES, and it's recognized by A2LA and NIST through a, a common agreement across the globe. There's over 80 countries have signed this. So, so that's really important that you be able to demonstrate that you have traceability from your process 
that transmitter or RTD measurement has been checked all the way back to internet, uh, internationally agreed standards. Okay, so that covers our basics today. So Roy, I'm going to turn this over to you and let you uh, maybe make real world out of what I've been talking about. Got it. Thank you, Ned. So let me just show my screen here. So first off, Ned, can you see my calibrator on my desktop? I sure can. Looks good. Okay, wow. very good. Now, to start off with, I don't want to start off with too much reality right off the bat. So quality control, measurements. Did you know? Oh, I need to put this right here. A culture ahead of its time, the Code of Hammurabi, 1750 B.C., made watering down beer punishable by death. And there's just a side note here, a little bit harsh by today's standards. But that's 3,767 years ago, roughly. Now, how precise is that date? It, they went to the actual year. If you wanted more precision, we're talking about accuracy and we're talking about precision. What's the difference between accuracy and precision? Precision is more granularity, if you will. It's more decimal places. If we're talking time, then years, we could be more precise if we had how many days and hours and seconds. The same thing on a globe. If you have latitude and longitude, you have how many degrees, and then you have minutes and seconds. The minutes and the seconds are what make you more precise. If you are framing your house, you're going to use something like this speed square. And the funny thing is that a, a speed square is actually a triangle. Am I the only one that finds that funny? So on this thing, you can do a number of different things with that, but there's actually a, a ruler across the top here, and it's it goes down to quarter-inch delineations. That's not too fine for making a nice piece of furniture, but for framing a house, cutting the studs, a quarter inch is, is probably okay, but if you need something more precise, you take your standard and get one that's more precise. So this thing is more precise. This is in millimeters as well as inches, and this does have some limitations that, for example, if I wanted to measure this pen, I could stay away. And that... Okay, so it doesn't work really good in this example, but there's a point where this actually works really well. We also have a tape measure. So a tape measure, this one is in, well, centimeters. It's down to the millimeter as well as sixteenth inch, sixteenth of an inch. And this works well in some cases. If you need even more precision, then you'll take something like this. So this is uh, actually a, a British-made square. I grabbed all these items from my wood shop just to give you some examples. This goes all the way down to the 64th of an inch as well as a millimeter. So different measurement techniques. And finally, if you take a can, a beverage, it doesn't even have to be a frosty beverage, but a can itself, is it taller this way or is it longer going around? If we take the can and we measure it, what is that? That's just about five inches. And then to, how am I going to measure around it? Well, we could take this little floppy thing that we didn't think was good for anything, and we can run this thing around the can. And we get something a little bit over eight inches is what we're getting. So it's actually the circumference is longer than the height of the can. And that's even the case with this thing. It's, it's what? A little eight and a quarter inches in circumference, but if we take we take the tape measure here, and so this guy is like six and a quarter inches tall. So the same thing. It's actually further around than it is up and down. The calibration lab. Here's what I have. I've got a calibrator, and it's got a bunch of different connections hooked up to it. This is what I'm going to do. The first example, I have a pressure transmitter, and I've got a pressure source, and I have a, 
a pressure hose that has three different legs on it and it's going from the calibrator to the device under test and then to our pressure source. So I've already taken the time to, to load these onto the calibrator and the top two are what I'll do. So I have it called PT-14.5 and that's because the range is actually 14.5 PSI. I've got all my connections, hopefully, and there was a note flashed up right away that said, make sure to zero my pressure transducer. That's what I'll do right now. I'll hit the zero button. And now I'll hit start. I have a two second delay in between each test point. So let me just close off my vent and I'll take it up. I don't need to get it exactly on 17.25. I'll just stop it in that gray bar and it's calculating the output versus the input. So I don't have to get it exact. I just need to get it close. And it's calculating the error across the top. So we'll get an error statement here, and I'm doing this real quick on purpose. So my mat maximum error was 0.215% of span. The graph itself is here. The blue lines represent my tolerance, and this test actually passed. It's within our blue, uh, the blue bands, which means it's within our tolerance. So let me go down again. I didn't specify what my tolerance was, but my maximum error allowed was set to 0.25% of span. So the, the very first one was the farthest out. The zero is pretty far out on this transmitter. I'm not going to take the time to, to adjust this, and that's, that's not part of this webinar. But if I were to fix this, I would fix the zero first, and then I would adjust the span, and then I'd perform another calibration that would be my as left. So let me save this. I'll save it as found and leave it. Let me go back. Now, this first one I did, I calibrated it with a 30 PSI pressure module. Now the next one is with a 300 PSI pressure module. Now, I need to go in here and actually change this I'm doing this on purpose. I, you always want to use the smallest pressure module that you have that it is, will work with your test. All right, so I'm taking the correct one here and turning it into the not correct one. I uh, probably could have said that better. But I need to actually change where I'm connecting as well. So now I know that I need to move the hose from the left-hand module and put it into the middle one. Let me do that right now. Do we have any um, nice music we could play while I do this? That sounds like a no. Hey, I'm still over here. Okay, so that's done. And so I'm on the 20C. Let me hit my check mark, and that all looks good. Let me hit check, and I'm going to vent here. I'm hooked up to a different pressure module. I need to make sure to zero that as well. And now I'll hit start. So it still is passing. Now I need to take it up to my midpoint. And if I were doing this for real, I would actually do an up and down. Pressure tends to have hysteresis more than temperature does. So I would do an up and down test, but for time's sake, we're just gonna do a three up. And done. All right, so let me set that pressure module down, pressure pump. So we had about the same error, 0.221%. Let me scroll down to look at the graph itself. Um, the graph looks pretty darn similar. And here are the results. Let me save this as well. Now, through the magic of technology, I've actually done this test already, and I've uploaded it into our software. So if I take a quick look, at my 20C, this is my 300 PSI module, this is my graph, all right? Still within our blue lines. And now I'll click on the 30 PSI module, it looks exactly the same, but it's not. And I'm not gonna show you visually why it's different, but let me point this out. If I go back to the 300 PSI module and we look at the data, let's look at the table down below, our first test point, our input uncertainty was 0 0.03 PSI, uncertainty. So this is the uncertainty from the perspective of the calibration standard, which is the pressure module inside the calibrator. Now, 0 0.03 PSI, remember that number. If I go up to the 30 PSI module, 
the input uncertainty is different. It has one more decimal place. 0 0.003 is our uncertainty from the calibration standard. So what have we learned from this? You've learned that there is a, a smaller uncertainty with the smaller pressure module. When we use a larger pressure module to measure the small value, there's a higher uncertainty. And we're looking at that right here from the table. So with that, Ned, I think, I think we're ready to do the Q&A. Is there anything else that I've missed on this topic? No, that was great. Uh, I appreciate, uh, I even learned something. So, uh, so it's a factor of 10 using the two different uh, ranges that you did. Yes, sir. All right. So I think, Sarah, we're going to bring you in. Yes, sir. Katie, you make... guys have done a really good job demystifying the finer points of uncertainty, or we just need to hear more because we only have two questions. So we'll get through this pretty quickly. Um, if you do have questions now, please enter them into the questions section on the right-hand corner of your screen. So let's start this off. Can one of you explain to us why it's important for your known reference standard to be four times more accurate than your than the instrument being tested? <laughs> I'm going to say stay tuned on that one. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to cover that, but obviously uh, you want to use something more accurate than the instrument being tested. So uh, four to one is a common. Uh, ratio or a common practice out there in the market. So that is our, that, that'll come up in part two here. Okay. Then just one more and then we'll get back to it. Okay, so hysteresis is more for mechanical devices, right? And he says a little bit of extra information, spring, sl spring slop, movement change. So, well, <laughs> That's a true statement that hysteresis is more prevalent or more prominent in a in a physical device than an electronic. So I think that's a true statement. But you can still have hysteresis in an, in a uh, in an electronic component. But even even though we have this this pressure module here, there's still a physical component to this. There's a um, a diaphragm that ends up getting pushed against a against a transducer and that ends up being converted into an electrical signal. So even though this isn't a, an old flapper nozzle uh, valve, it still has a physical component in here to where hysteresis can play a part. Yeah, hysteresis to me is memory. So as you flex something or change something on a sensor, it it retains memory whether you're going up or coming down. Uh, so if you, in the case of pressure or a gauge, as the uh, fellow that asked the question, as you push it to its maximum, as you come back, it, it tends to stay towards the 100% that you stressed it to, as opposed to when you're coming up, it kind of tends to lean towards the zero percent. So, so whether you're going up or coming down, you might see hysteresis. Uh, today's instruments really are so much better um, the way they can handle that. So hysteresis is not as big a factor. But uh, Roy said he wanted to do an up-down test on his pressure standard, on his pressure transmitter, and that that's kind of just common practice, but really if that make model and he he does enough up-down tests, let's say he does 50 up-down tests and he never observes hysteresis, you could save time by not doing an up-down test. But Agreed. you really should prove, you should prove that to yourself uh, or prove that to your to your quality people before you make that decision. Okay. We have more audience members join, joining the conversation, so I'll just keep on going with their questions. Is it mandatory for a pressure transmitter and a temperature transmitter in flow metering streams to be calibrated in a specific interval? Hmm. 
No, I don't think it's mandatory. There, but there may be, depending on your industry, there could be uh, some requirement that that mandates that. But we've done other presentations, and and uh, my position is always do some tests and figure out what the drift is, and and come up with the optimum interval. So if you're trying to be very accurate on your flow measurement, you're probably going to have to go out more often. Um, if um, you know if your requirements aren't as tight, then maybe you don't have to go. You can go out once a year or even longer. Uh, and then same thing, if the temperature standard never drifts, you could do it every other time. But that that would depend on history to make those kind of judgments. So so that's true, and the real answer to that question is, Ned alluded to it, that you need to capture some data in order to answer that question. If if you actually gather data, maybe you're calibrating it every year, and you calibrate that thing three years in a row, and it's totally flat, you can actually take that interval and increase it by 50%. So calibrate that thing in every 18 months, or calibrate it in 18 months and see how it is there. If that still remains flat or within your, your margin of acceptability, then you have just saved time and money. It, that goes also with it's possible to calibrate too often. I, I'm not sure if I can, am I allowed to say that? But in <laughs> cases, you don't need to calibrate as often as you think in some cases. In some, if it's an SIS system, you may not have that flexibility. You may have to calibrate it more often as proof. But if you calibrate something and it's out every single time you go out there, then you need to shrink that interval. And instead of calibrating it every year, check it again in six months. Okay. Alrighty, so about ISO 9000, item 7.6. And I don't know, you might have to Google for this one, but let's see here. On the comment about uncertainty, is it necessary to find uncertainty for ISO 9000? Hmm, I'd, I'd have to look at it. My, uh, my take on ISO 9000 standards and, and even 17025 is it, it is a guideline, it's a, a loose frame of information and you need to uh, apply that framework to how you operate your facility and and meet the minimums. Um, so there are quality standards out there that talk about um, that you need to know uncertainty. So I, I would say it depends on your industry and uh, the applicate you know the quality of the measurement you're trying to make. I don't know, Roy, can you help me out? So yeah, I think that's up to the accrediting organization. So for example, with 17025. If, if you're getting audited by A2LA, you, it's my understanding that you have to know and be able to calculate the uncertainty of the standards that you're using for your calibration. And we're talking about a proper metrology lab here. And 9,000, I don't know the answer to that. So Sarah, why don't you put that one to the side for us and maybe we need to, to do a little research and get a better answer via email. Okay, yeah. we'll do that. And Katie, I wasn't looking at the time when we started, so please stop me when we start to go over. We have a lot of questions now. All right. I so think we could take one or two more. We have about three, three or four more minutes. Okay, thank you. So, in regards to devices with the diaphragm, the calibration difference is most likely the sensor being dirty. Why do we not have access to that sensor? Hmm. Are you talking? They must be talking about the BMX calibrator, Roy. You think the, they're saying they don't have access to the sensor? You know, I'm not sure. Inside table that one. Then I think I need a little more info. That could be an RTD probe, and you can't pull it, or something like that. I don't know. We'll definitely answer your question in an email after the webinar. Uh, let's see here. What can be the impact of the calibration procedure to the uncertainty of the measured results? Well, you're going to learn something. <laughs> you're going to learn that you're that you've got 
uh, you might learn something bad that your transmitter is more accurate than what you're using to make the measurement with, but most times you're probably going to confirm that you're making a sound quality measurement and uh, just covering your bases in case you're audited. Okay. We'll address the rest of the questions in the final Q&A session of the webinar. So let's move right along now. Katie, you want to take it from here? Yes, of course. Thank you, Sarah. Before we hand it back over to Ned to continue with the presentation, I wanted to put a save the date on the calendar. There is the ISA Process Control and Safety Symposium, which is November 7th through the 9th at the Houston Marriott West Chase in Houston, Texas. And we will also send you a link if you're interested in attending this event that you can access more information. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ned to continue on with the presentation. Okay, here we go. Um, so, Ned, uh, I think you have violated the number of words that we allow on a single slide. I mean, not to be rude, but yeah, this is really bad. Um, so could you read it for me? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> no. Are you kidding? Okay. Well, we're in luck here. We, um, I do have another slide that maybe simplifies all that information. So, Much better. Um, so here we are. We're really kind of taking a deep dive here. So uh, hopefully we won't put you to sleep. But uh, now we're going to talk a little bit more about uncertainty. And let's just break it down. There's different components. So we have, we have random error, we have systematic error, and then there's maybe other errors. How about that? So things that are random and really are out of our control, uh, those have been categorized as type A components. And things that are systematic that maybe we can address and deal with, those are categorized as type B errors. So things that are random is that if you're making multiple measurements, so let's say you do Roy's up-down test two or three times, each test point that he data logs going up on pressure they're going to be slightly different. It's going to be, you know, he's using the same method, the same pump, and same procedure, but the numbers aren't going to be exactly the same out to three, four decimals. Uh, obviously, yeah. it's not going to be reproducible. Parallax is really your eye looking at a gauge, an analog gauge, and, and everybody's eyes are a little different. And uh, depending on the angle of where your head is, you've got the parallax. So those are examples of random things. There's plenty of other examples. But notice the list for systematic. Uh, we're talking about a single measurement. So when you do an as-found test, you're making single measurements. You're maybe going up and down, but it's just one cycle. Um, the standard you're using, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is that day that you're using it. And, uh, you know, the temperature is pretty consistent and you're only out there for, you know, less than an hour or maybe it might be something more complicated. You're out there for a couple hours, but the temperature is pretty consistent over that test period. And then finally, uh, if you are recording things, people can fat finger things or you can't read the writing or if they're having to make a calculation, they could they could make an, a mistake. Those hey, are... Ned, can I interrupt for a sec? Sure, sure. I just wanted to point out, so one thing on the... Type A, and we're talking parallax. If we if we look at, at pressure gauges as an example, so parallax, as Ned mentioned, is it means that it as you change how you're looking at, for example, this pressure gauge. If you're if you close your left eye, look at with your right, or reverse that, you'll actually get a different number because you're looking at it from a different angle, and it's really hard to tell on a, a simple gauge like this, but if you have a high precision pressure gauge like this, this has a mirrored edge all the way around it. And the, uh, uh, Ned, what do you call this? A pointer? Or yeah, the, the pointer, thank you. Why can't I think of pointer? <laughs> but the pointer itself stretches across the mirror so that you can see, if you, as you twist it, 
you can see if you're dead over the top of it or if you see a shadow you know you're not looking at it straight on so that's how you eliminate parallax with a high precision pressure gauge like this and one final thing that I'll say about type B components is that it's sometimes said that type B components can actually be calculated to minimize the effect because these might be things where if you have a temperature compensation that's a calculation that can adjust for the change in temperature to resolve that uncertainty value from your measurement. So that's all I had, Ned. Yeah, and just to wrap it up, you know, random error, you, you really, uh, there's not much you can do about it. You have to live with it. But systematic error, uh, mathematically, you can, you can take you can do some averaging. You can average those kind of errors where if it's random error, if it's something that you really can't deal with no matter what the situation is, you, you kind of have to add those types of errors together. So whether they're type A, type B, or other errors, when we talk about uncertainty, if you look at this graph on the right, we're talking about taking each component and somehow doing analysis to determine what is the overall error and how do these different subcomponents add to the overall error. So that's, that's kind of what uncertainty is. It's, it's, it's a way to analyze and combine all the different types of errors that might be contributing to your measurement and helping you make a good judgment. So let's move on to the next slide. And, and we're talking statistics now, so we're using math. So expanded uncertainty is, uh, is dealing with a, a confidence level. So we're looking at, at data. And if you remember from school, back in high school, or if you took a statistics class especially, you'll remember this bell curve. And the idea is, is that most of your data will occur here in the center, but then you're going to have outlier type data that, it, that will uh, either be plus or minus here on the high and low side. Um, so, you know, we've seen these, this bell curve is a very common phenomenon. And when we talk about uh, a confidence level, you know, people say a, a, sig a one sigma confidence is only 68% of the region of this bell curve. So two sigma encompasses 95%. So this, this little part of this triangle and this little part over here is outside our confidence level. But it's, you know, we're saying that 5% of our information might be outside of what we're expecting. Uh, three sigma gets us really close. It's out here to the very edge. And I threw six sigma on this slide because in quality you hear of six sigma all the time. Well, the idea of six sigma is that you're, you're just about perfect. I mean, how much closer can you get to perfection than a number like this? So, so uh, that's where the slogan six sigma comes from. But in the world of metrology and uh, and we, I have some more slides that will kind of back this up. And we're in this engineering world. We're in this process control world. If we're this close, you know, this gets the job done for us. Uh, we don't have to be this precise. This can be very expensive to try to achieve this kind of accuracy or, or uncertainty in making a measurement. But uh, if we understand that we have some margin for problems uh, and we analyze what we're doing, you know, this gets us pretty darn close. So, uh, so sort of the accepted practice that's evolved in metrology is two sigma is a very good way to go. And one comment on that is that with, with two sigma, we're talking about field calibrations here. The, if we're doing a, a proper metrology lab where you have a, a standards that you're calibrating, then then yes, go to a higher confidence level. And, and, one, way to, and one way to do that, Roy, these, like on your test, you did a three-point check, but you could do it a second time. You could do two cycles of a three-point check. True. Or you could do three. 
So the more data you have, then that's how you get to this higher confidence level. So if you see the same thing three times, obviously your confidence level is going to get up into this area here. But who has time to check something three times? And in, in our world, the first time is good enough. It, it's representative of how that transmitter is acting. That's true. And it's not just time, it's money. Exactly. Okay. So this is a stock picture for BMX, but um, this poor guy, I think, really fits this slide. So I'm going to throw another acronym at you. Um, and I, I got this data from one of our sales engineers, Eric Webb, but uh, this is just an example of, of a calculation of a gross uncertainty of measurement. So we're taking we're trying to take in all the components of an RTD connected to a transmitter. And we're going to use this technique, and this is, again, this is very uh, common in the marketplace to use what's called a root sum squared technique to average the type B uh, components of error. So in this example, we have a transmitter, and uh, the component A and the component B, we got two numbers off the spec sheet, and it has that it's a 0.05% of span accuracy instrument, and it has a 0.1% of span uh, noise factor that you have to account for. One wait, thing wait, that, wait, 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 wait. So are you telling me that if I have a transmitter that's accurate out to 0.05% of span, that I can't just calibrate it to 0.05% of span? Well, no, because that's one component, and that's what everybody, that's, so that's a good question, Roy. Everybody focuses on the accuracy, but this is twice as big as this. And we don't even look at the EMC immunity influence, but uh, in this case, it's quite significant compared to this guy. The other thing that bothers me on this example is there's no, there's no drift, and we all know instruments drift. So... You know, how does this instrument perform in six months? How does it perform in 12 months? It's, it's going to be different than 0.05%. So one of the things I like to say about accuracy, it's really kind of an off-the-shelf number. It's, it's a number that uh, it, it's there the day it was tested. And, and then uh, remember on the earlier slide, what was the reference standard that established this number? Is it accurate to a tenth of a degree C? That's another important component. Um, so this instrument is spanned to 200 degrees C in this example. So if we take 0.5% times 200, we get this number, the tenth. And here, this is double, so if we take 0.1% times 200, now we're, we've got an additional 0.2 degrees. Now let's look at the RTD. So this RTD has, a, uh, has been certified or is specified to operate from uh, nearly minus 200 to 600 degrees C, or the equivalent in Fahrenheit. And since we're talking about 200 degrees C, and notice that since it's a probe, it doesn't really have, um, you know, a percent of span type number. The, uh, it has a, an estimated error at freeze, you know, when it's cold, below freezing, at freezing, at boiling, and at a higher temperature. So, so we're going to go with what, what is its accuracy at 200 since that's kind of the worst case of the, of the numbers. And that happens to match the span here that we did. But the RTD has additional components. So right off the spec sheet, we have stability. Now, again, I'm having a problem with this because it doesn't say one year or six months. Uh, here, here's another factor is the temperature cycle. So as you go up and down, you're going to see differences. Uh, and here's that hysteresis. Now look at this. The hysteresis is as significant as the accuracy component. So again, Roy asked a while ago, if this is accurate to half a degree, can't we just go with that? But if you're going up, if your process goes up and down in temperature, it's it it can potentially double 
what what it measures. And then also uh, vibration has an effect on the probe's output. So here's the trick. This is the RSS. So we've got all these numbers and we've converted everything to degree C. So this is a statistical average. We're going to take each component of type B error and square it. So we're going to square the 0 0.1, the 0 0.2, and the 0.55. All these different numbers, we're going to square them, add them together, and then take the square root. So in that case, so if you do all this math, you're going to end up with a combined uncertainty of 0 0.806 degrees. So we'll just say 0 0.8 degrees. And that's calculated at 200 degrees C. So it's obviously better at lower temperatures. Uh, but since the stability wasn't stated very clearly here and not at all up here, you know, a conservative approach would be to just, let's just double this number and it's almost like hope. Let's hope that we stay better than one and a half degrees after a year with these two components. And if you take the one and a half degree estimate and divide by the 200, that's a 0.75% of span. So Roy was doing some stuff to 0.25% and we're coming up with the probe on top of this guy, we're coming up with uh, an overall sort of loop error of 0.75%. So I know this was a bit tedious, but I just wanted to go through some real numbers and show you how you can combine these different error components and come up with an estimate that uh, meets your requirements. And, and again, this is, you know, when you get this basic number, it's up to you to assess the risk that you're willing to take uh, in, in, making, in making a final decision. So that's a good point. I think this does help us visualize why we can't just take an accuracy statement from a transmitter and then calibrate it to that value. There are so many different things that, that come into play, and if we calibrate this thing to 0.05% of span or 0.1 degrees Celsius, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So just one other comment um, is, well, this actually goes back to, is your standard accurate enough? So we'll find that out as well on the next phase here. So thank you, Ned. All right. So one more slide and then we're going to let Roy take over here. Um, so one more acronym, test uncertainty ratio, and there, there's a related uh, acronym, but let's just focus on our keyword today, uncertainty. So, you know, the first point is, um, is it's just using common sense, you shouldn't be testing something, you can't test something with a standard that is of the same accuracy class as the instrument you're testing. It, you know, which is more accurate, the instrument or the calibration standard? So you're not going to use Roy's little small test gauge, the little small one he held up, to calibrate that nice transmitter that uh, we measured with, uh, uh, you know, with our calibrator. So, uh, you know, so in that case, if you just have a one-to-one -one ratio, you're really not doing something uh, of good quality. And then if you find out that it's less than one-to-one, -one, then you're really in trouble. So, you know, the things to do are kind of like what Roy alluded to. You could open up your process error so that you can get a better ratio to where your standard has some degree of coverage over what you're trying to measure. Or you need to get some more accurate test equipment. So here's a definition of test uncertainty ratio. It is the ratio of the tolerance or specification of the test measurement in relation to the uncertainty in the measurement result. So it's, we're looking at what, you know, what's the ratio from the standard to the process. That's kind of a simple way to say it. And by using this as a guideline, and, the, and our first question today was exactly on this topic, is it helps you evaluate how much risk you're taking. So if you're in this one-to-one -one ratio, that's a lot of risk. If you have a better ratio, your risk goes down. And it 
and by doing this analysis you're validating and qualifying your calibration program and here's a little formula so basically this is the uh, upper and lower range of or of the error versus the uncertainty and if you remember this U is very can be very complicated um, if I go back to this slide here you know we're talking this kind of thing <laughs> so uh, so this is not as simple as it looks and so where does the four to one come from oh you must have known the next bullet so the four to one goes way back I, I you know I would say people were looking at this ratio uh, back in the 1800s back when uh, metrology methods were first established in Britain and, and France and and then when the United States you know we were all in trade we had to get on a common common denominator for weights and measures and things so so uh, people start you know the meter was established the degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit all those things were going on well you know back in the early days people were trying to get a 10 to 1 ratio but uh, as equipment improved and techniques improved and and so on and so forth 10 to 1 is really hard to get um, so 4 to 1 uh, was formally adopted as a military standard by the US De Department of Defense in 1988 but as I say it that this guideline was around what maybe since the 50s with the Department of Defense and earlier than that with other metrology folks uh, but it was first documented by uh, US Department of Defense in the United States and then it was incorporated by the ANSI NCSL remember that's the United States organizations and the Z540s uh, very well known in the quality world so in 1994 this 4 to 1 was adopted as well as using 2 sigma uncertainty and things like that so 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 the 4 to 1 is kind of the the litmus test or it's the goal it's not always achievable you may the best you can do may be one to one so there's some things you can do if you know that you have a poor quality measurement going on you can do repeatability or you can check it more often you can send your standard off more often than it normally would be in order to be assured that you're getting somewhere close to true but once you get to this four to one window your confidence can go way up and uh, uh, it's just good practice is, is let's leave it at that and I'm gonna throw this I this concept out you know in our laboratory at BMEX we try to have a 10 to 1 ratio and we don't always achieve it on all our components but uh, for instance on when you're checking the multimeter part of our calibrator you know we use a nice laboratory meter that maybe has six decimal places of resolution and we're checking the four decimal places on a milliamp readout so in that case we we probably have better than a 10 to 1 ratio uh, so again this is a target it's not an absolute or you're not going to fail if you're not achieving these results but it's a way for you to analyze and get to where you need to be to make good quality measurements and just to reiterate um, today's instrumentation is better than ever uh, BMEX is being pushed to uh, to make our calibrators better every generation calibrator we've tried to uh, uh, come out with better measurement accuracy and uh, we're out to three decimal places now for RTDs uh, you know we have some really nice temperature specifications but there's stuff out there that's you know way better than what we're doing but for a field instrument you know we're we're delivering something very good so so you know I leave you with this statement that as a as an end user a maintenance person you got a real challenge to uh, to try to achieve this in your process plant because you've got control engineers pushing pushing this side of the equation and that means you gotta buy more expensive equipment to maintain this ratio so any other thoughts Roy before I move on uh, no sir not on that all right
So I'm going to turn it over to you, Roy, and help us understand uncertainty a little better. But it, you really, I am not sure that's a good idea. Let me take back control here. So just verify that you can see my calibrator. Yes, sir. Okay. Clear. So with this, uh, what am I doing next? I'm doing this. I mean. I've got a calibrator hooked up to a, an RTD temperature transmitter, and I'm using the calibrator to simulate an RTD probe, and then I'm also measuring the current output from it, as well as providing loop power. So I've taken the numbers that Ned had given us previously, and I've got TT200. This is a temperature transmitter that we actually got all the numbers off of uh, from before, 0 to 200C. and What's my tolerance? Quarter percent of span, that's what it is. So let me, there's no zeroing here because it's all electronic. So let me just hit start. I'm doing a three up down test, I believe. So I just had a two second delay in between each, each uh, test point. So now we're doing the span, 100 degrees is our midpoint. So we're coming back down again. So this is a pretty quick three up down. I just wanted to just jam through this. And this is the graph of what I've got. I've got a little bit of hysteresis, and visually, this is what hysteresis looks like. When you're going up and when you're coming back down, it's those midpoints. Are they giving you different values on the way up versus on the way down? So that's a, a quick definition of hysteresis. So let me just save this as found. Now, I've already unloaded this as well. So let me go back to the the electronic copies of, of this and so my TT200 is this. So this is what I'm looking at. Now if I look at the the, uh, the table of the information I've got an input uncertainty 0 0.05 degrees Celsius and I've got an output uncertainty of 0 0.0014 so 1.4 microamps. Now we have been talking about uncertainty and uncertainty is sometimes difficult to grasp unless you can see it and I want everybody to pay attention I'm gonna show it to you visually right now I need to change one setting here so let me just go up and change it I'll turn on show expanded uncertainty and now you're looking at it what you're seeing let me show you on the on the high end on the 200 degrees you see the test point the little dot then you see lines above and below that dot. This is the uncertainty shown in a visual representation. So I think this is the easiest way to talk about uncertainty. You can talk about it and normally when you talk about uncertainty you have a guy that's got one of those propeller hats that's talking about it, all these details, but five seconds later your eyes are completely glossed over and you have no idea what they even said. But if you have a visual representation then it's at least I'm visual so that makes it easier for me to understand so this is a visual representation of the uncertainty at every single test point. Roy could you maximize your your software window? So okay. is, is that helping at all? No. No it's still the same scale? <laughs> but Roy what talk about the numbers in the expanded uncertainty column. So we have our input uncertainty and then the output uncertainty and then we have the combination the percent of span so Ned as you were saying so is this our two sigma representation well what we do is we take the the O5 degree C and uh, divide that by span and square it it's a percentage number then we take the milliamps divide that by 16 because that's the span and square that number then we take the square root of it and we get we get the expanded uncertainty column. So what's the biggest number in that column? Because it is hard to see. The expanded? Yeah, what's the highest value in that column? Oh, the the midpoint, 0 0.04327. So if you take your 0.25 and divide by 0 0.04, you've got like a 5 to 1 test uncertainty ratio, better than 5 to 1. So that, and you can, as you said, 
graphically, you can kind of see, yeah, that little guard band is one-fifth of the blue line that we're trying to get in the process. So that kind of helps pull what I presented maybe together a little better. All right, so let me, I guess, finish up with the pressure side. We started off doing a pressure demo, and we calibrated the same pressure transmitter, but we used two different pressure standards two different pressure transducers. We used a 30 PSI and we used a 300 PSI module. Just to remind you what was the range of our transmitter under test, it was 14.5 PSI. So why do we always use the smallest pressure module we can? Here's the answer. First, let's look at the 300 PSI module. Now that we have uncertainty shown visually, you can see, let's look at the, the far right test point. And I'm, I'm sorry that I can't make this larger. I will show you in a PDF, which will be a little easier to see. Thanks for bringing that up, Sarah. So this is just about a one-to-one. -one. Our tolerance is about the same as our uncertainty. And is this a good test? Is this a good recording of data? Is this a good standard to use? And the answer is no. If we look over at the first test point, the test point itself was right under, it was just marginal. It just passed. But by the time we add in the uncertainty, it could be anywhere across that line. In reality, this uh, value could be anywhere between these two dashes. Now, let me click on the 30 PSI module. And you can see that those guard bands are much smaller, much tighter. Here, if the guard bands are a quarter of the size of our full tolerance, then we're having a four to one test uncertainty ratio. And I'm just guessing visually, we might even be closer to five to one on this one. And it is possible to even use a, a 15 PSI module to get the test uncertainty ratio even smaller. Now, I promised you a PDF. Let me. Let me show you that. So here's my calibration certificate for my 30 PSI, and let me click on the 300 PSI. Here's my calibration certificate. I'll scroll down, so I'm just looking at the graph itself. And here's the graph on the 30 PSI. So now you should be able to see both of them, and you should be able to see those guard bands. Is this coming through OK, Sarah, Ned? Looks good, thank you. Good. Okay. Now there's also an uncertainty that we had for the temperature, and this is our temperature reading here. I've got it on a separate PDF. So you can see the guard bands on that as well. So there is uncertainty with every single measurement that you take. It's just a matter of, do you want to open your eyes and know what it is? So I'll just leave these the two pressure ones up, but that concludes my portion of this. Where do we want to take it next? Well, I think we uh, we're ready to wrap it up. Um, All but, right, Kate, uh, that I'm was really you. that was really good, Roy. Uh, let me turn on my. So I think we have one more slide to uh, to wrap things up here, and uh, so we hope you know with what we've done today. Let's see if I can get this to. There we go. Uh, we hope we helped you understand what the term uncertainty means, and we want you to utilize best practices for making good quality measurements. Uh, that was one of our goals today. And we use this, what's called the RSS method, or root sums of the squares. And it is a recognized technique by many uh, accrediting bodies as a way to analyze error and to help you under you know calculate a, uh, an expanded uncertainty and if we go back to our little uh, uh, our little pedigree where we get from process back to international standards we kind of came up with a, a, a sort of a, an analogy if you look if you were to look to the heavens you know, if you looked with your naked eye, you really wouldn't see that much detail. You'd see a lot of, a lot of dots in the sky. But if you were able to get out a pair of binoculars, now you could kind of zoom in on an area of the sky and really start to see some detail. And then if you had a nice telescope, depending on the quality of that, obviously you can see uh, 
much more detail in a very small space. And then finally, if you had the ultimate tool <laughs> to look at the heavens, uh, and there's some really cool things now that they've reworked that uh, on what they're seeing out there in the, in the world. So maybe this will help you understand why you need to have traceability and why you need to look at the quality of the measurement you're making at, at each level and how it's important and they all relate. So bottom line is, is if you do not consider uncertainty when making measurements, then you just don't know the quality of your measurements. So if you think back to Roy's demo where the measurement was one to one, it, they, they both look good. The curve came out the same. Uh, yeah. That had the same slope and it barely passed at zero and was almost spot on at span. But the quality of the measurement was very suspect. And you don't know at that zero if you really were in a pass or fail condition because uh, you weren't using the appropriate standard. And I guess the biggest takeaway uh, is we, you know, everybody always focuses on accuracy, but yeah. calibration is so much more than just plain accuracy. There's just a lot more to it, and we hope we've conveyed that message to you today. Yeah, so one final comment on that is that uncertainty tends to get swept under the rug just because it's too complicated. And if you take out each individual piece, like we did on that sheet that uh, from the numbers we got from Eric Webb, then you can it does help demystify. You just take it one little bite at a time. Okay, so I think, Sarah, we're ready for you again. I think so. So this first question, I believe you guys addressed earlier on, but let's see if you can add a little bit more to it. What is the best method for determining a baseline frequency for your calibration program? Well, we did that in another webinar, didn't we, Roy? So that we could That's point true. them to that. Maybe uh, Sarah or Katie could send them to that webinar. But um, at the end of the day, what I say is you got to make the best guess that you can. So, and most people guess conservative. So maybe check something quarterly or every six months. But after you, as Roy said, after you do three tests, one, two, three, you can, uh, you'll start to see maybe a pattern. Is it random? Is it going up and down? Or are you seeing a trend? And uh, so if it's, if you're yeah. seeing a bad trend, it's maybe failed on the second test and you adjusted it and it's still drifting, you need to tighten up your frequency. But most time, people are conservative, they're over calibrating. And uh, chances are, after you build some history, you can, you can start backing off on your frequency, like Roy gave an example of 50%, you know, or you could even double the, the uh, frequency if it's not that critical or important a measurement. And time is money. So uh, it's definitely, uh, the interval is a big deal, and instruments have gotten so much better. So if you've been calibrating for 20 years and doing something every six months, I can tell you the instrumentation is much better today than it was 20 years ago, and you probably could back off. Okay. Would you base calibrations on critical and non-critical systems? Well, uh, the place to start is your critical ones. I, I think if you really focus on your critical instruments and measurements in your plant and get a calibration program going for those first, then what you learn and what you develop there can be easily applied to the non-critical and you can expand out. And again, if they're non-critical, maybe you don't have to check them as often, so you can kind of blend it into your, the work you're doing on the critical ones. Agreed. As far as uncertainty calculations go in the oil and gas industry, is custody transfer metering the only method to check the system? Uh, no, I mean, probably, I maybe don't understand the question, but custody transfer, you really want to do uh, an uncertainty analysis and, uh, you know, there'll be people in your company that will say that your measurements 
aren't accurate enough. I mean, there'll be somebody making that argument. Can, how can you make it more accurate? Because if you look at your error and apply dollars to that, if you're off by that much error, you know, how many dollars is that, you know, annualized based on the flow rate of the natural gas or whatever it is you're measuring? So for custody transfer, if you do the uncertainty analysis and look at what error is, is acceptable, you're probably going to have to use a deadweight tester or a very good calibrator, you know, to make the best measurement, the best quality measurement. Um, and even a deadweight tester in the field might not be practical if you count specific gravity error, uh, the handling of the weights are sort of uh, some some user errors that can cause problems. Uh, is the is the deadweight tester level? So there's all these other components that could impact the quality of that measurement. Yeah, I have one comment on custody transfer, and that's probably one of the most critical ones because you're dealing with other entities, and whether you're selling natural gas, um, oil going through a pipeline, or even water to another municipality, if you're if you're giving more than what you're charging for, you're actually giving away money, you're losing money. But if you do the opposite, you open yourself up to legal liability. So if you're charging for more than you're giving them, then you could actually end up in court. So uh, that the I guess custody transfer is an example of where you really today in today's world you have to do uh, an uncertainty analysis and establish your what's called your error budget. You know how much is acceptable to be off. Yep. All right. Who is authorized to conduct calibrations? <laughs> Uh, I mean, even Roy and I can do calibrations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I like the way you said that. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, calibration to me is school of hard knocks. Um, you know, the best people out there are the ones that have been doing it for a while. Uh, that you know, they're doing quality work and they know what it takes to make a uh, a, a good measurement, and they and when there's something's wrong, they know how to fix it. You know that uh, that all goes hand in hand. And uh, but you know, depending on the industry, uh, you know, we do training classes. People have to be certified on the equipment. So there's, you know, there are hurdles that people have to overcome. Uh, but if there's any young people out there watching, it's a great. It's a great way to make a living. Calibration is a great job, and uh, it it takes it takes a good level of skill. It's not just for anybody, and you you got to have a brain. You know, it's uh, it's. And ISA does have some great calibration classes as well. Yeah, so there's you know there, there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube as well. But yeah, uh, with ISA you can be certified. So um, I bet that was an ISA plant that question. <laughs> All righty. Does a five-point calibration give better confidence than, than a three-point check? Absolutely, because we're talking statistics. So more data means higher confidence. So um, absolutely, but but it costs you money. It, yeah. You know, you're you're basically doubling the time in the field, and if you're having to do an ass found and an ass left, it can be very significant. You know, it can it can add up. Yeah, more is better in this case, but but, but you need. But, but you can optimize. You know that what is the you know do you need to do five points if you can prove if you do five points for a while and you're seeing a straight line. You know maybe it's a different slope or something, but it's always a straight line. Like Roy showed a little bit of hysteresis, then maybe you need to do at least a three up and down. But if you're seeing a straight line every time, just do the up test. So it's uh, again, it comes down to history. Doing you know what what's happening at your plant and your facility with your equipment. I might mess this question up a bit, but we'll see. Most calibrators source an RTD three or four wire. Then in parentheses, they have compensating legs with a two wire with jumpers, does it affect accuracy? 
the jumpers is unacceptable. <laughs> I, um, you should either, if you've got a two-wire RTD, you should only be connecting two wires to the transmitter. Um, the uh, the four wire is going to give you the best accuracy. Yeah, there's a huge jump going from two wires over to three. So I would agree with that. Now, in my example, I did have jumpers, but that was just for the sake of doing a, a test on a demo test. Yeah, when the proper way when you calibrate is if you if you disconnect two wires, then the calibrator should connect with two wires. If you disconnect three wire RTD from the transmitter, you should connect three wires, three leads from the calibrator, and obviously four. True. And there, there's there is a huge jump from two to to three, and then there's a really significant jump from three to four. Um, but again, you can save money by buying three-wire RTDs, and if you're happy to be within a couple degrees, then that's they're quite ac quite accurate for that kind of work. Yep. Okay. If the sensor has a different accuracy rating than the transmitter, we take the lower accuracy, right? Oh man, was that question asked at the end of our presentation or in the beginning? See <laughs> here. You that average one. them. We want the answer is you average them together. So if you go back to that GUM, the gross uncertainty measurement, you you would look at all the components of error for the transmitter and the RTD. So that go to that screen, and and we do the root sum squares method to you know we square each component, add them together, take the square root, and that gives us a statistical average of all those error components and so whichever one's bigger it contributes most to that number so remember we were at 0 0.55 degrees was the uh, error for the RTD the accuracy of the RTD and we came up with an overall number of 0 0.8 so it's not like we doubled it or you know made it really bad but it the other errors contributed from the 0.55 level up to the 0.8 that we calculated. And then we were conservative by doubling it to account for a one-year drift. Yep. All right, we have one more question that we're able to answer within our time limits, and then those that were not answered we'll address in emails directly from Ned or Roy later on. So look out for those emails from us. So for the last question, can you explain why a temperature probe does not have a span accuracy? Um, temperature probes, Roy, you may have a different answer. Um, te temperature probes are, the way they're constructed, uh, improves the accuracy. So the, the better material, uh, the more weight of wire and things that can be used will contribute to a more accurate sensor. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the junction or the sensing element is very fragile and can be easily damaged. So when they're first constructed, temperature probes are pretty good. Um, and if you put them, if you test them in a dry block, um, They'll, they'll show up pretty good off the shelf, but just stressing it over a range of heat, so if you take it up to 500 degrees F or 1,000 degrees F, you're stressing the metal molecules in the, in the probe, and you're going to start causing physical changes to it, and it, it could uh, cause offsets. But the, the biggest thing I've seen in probes, especially RTDs, is if you drop them, and, and that shock changes the element physically, it creates a zero offset. So the probe is still might be accurate over the range, but it might have a zero offset. So if you shock it and it's off by a degree or two degrees at zero, you're going to see that it's off, and I'm talking Celsius or 32F freezing, you're going to see that same offset at the span. So. Um, 
you know, maybe you need to throw that probe away if you see a zero offset on it. But uh, and, and that's a good reason to never drop a probe into a dry block or into whatever. You want to place it gently because the the actual metal molecules you can get a fracture in there, and that does give you an offset, and it it, it takes away your accuracy. The only way to fix that is to have the probe re-annealed. You have to heat it up to the maximum temperature that that probe is capable of, and I guess that will reform the the uh, crystalline structure of the metal. Or just buy a new one. Yeah, if it's suspect, you probably just need to replace it. Sarah, you're muted. And thank you. And Katie, do you want to sign us off? Yes, absolutely. Come back to you guys here. All right, before I do, um, one quick final announcement is that uh, BMX does offer a blog with weekly, or excuse me, not weekly, but probably monthly articles about calibration. And there are a series of three all about calibration uncertainty. You can visit blog.vmex.com to read those right away. Um, and we'll also send you some links to that following the webinar. I want to thank Sarah um, for being a great host, along with Ned and Roy, for some excellent content. And for those of you that we didn't get to your questions, like Sarah said, we'll definitely email you the answers individually, or if you want to reach out to our presenters, um, if you come up with questions later on, feel free to do so, and their information is there on the screen for you. Um, finally, as a final reminder, there will be a survey that pops up at the end of this webinar once it's concluded, and we do appreciate any feedback and ideas for what you would like to see next. And once again, thank you all out there for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Yep. Thank you.